5. Second Corinthians chapter 5, and we're going to read from verse 16 to the end of the chapter. Second Corinthians chapter 5, and reading from verse 16. Let us hear again the word of the Lord. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Amen. We end our reading there. So let's uh, turn back to Psalm 32. Psalm 32, and we're going to consider this passage together. The title that I've given for this this evening's sermon is Forgiveness for Sinning Saints. Forgiveness for Sinning Saints. Between the two countries of North Korea and South Korea, there's a relic of a bygone age. Well, it's maybe not that far bygone, but it's a bridge known as the Bridge of No Return. And this particular bridge was used for prisoner exchanges at the time of the Korean War ceasefire in 1953. The name of this bridge comes from the final ultimatum that was given to prisoners of war as they were brought to this bridge for return to their home country. And that ultimatum was that they could either remain in the country of of their captivity or they could cross the bridge to return to their homeland. But the catch was this, once they chose to cross that bridge, they would never be allowed to return. In this life, as believers in Christ, we are in a war against sin. And sometimes, and quite often, in fact, believers fall in this war. Day and daily, we lose skirmishes with sin. But from time to time, we suffer major defeats. All of our sins, but especially these major defeats by sin, they mar our fellowship with God and they hinder our enjoyment of him. When this happens, can we hope for any restoration to our fellowship with God? Or is sin in the life of a believer a bridge of no return? Does the believer forever forfeit all the blessedness of salvation when they sin? When the believer makes that conscious, that willful decision to sin against God, is there any way back home to the Father? This is perhaps a very real question in your own mind. Perhaps you are a believer who once walked close with God, but your fellowship with the Lord has been decimated by sin. You experience estrangement from God, and perhaps you feel you can never go back to him. And perhaps perhaps you don't even want to go back to him. As far as you're concerned, Your sin has become a bridge of no return. Well, if that's you, then this psalm is for you. It's thought by some that David penned this psalm sometime after he penned Psalm 51. Whenever the prophet Nathan challenged him regarding his sin with Bathsheba, David had been found guilty at God's tribunal, guilty of adultery 
murder and cover up. But in this psalm, in Psalm 32, David relates for us how he found forgiveness and restoration of fellowship with his God. In this psalm, David is teaching us that sin is not a bridge of no return. God is the God who forgives. He is the God who restores the blessings of his covenant with us. There is a welcome. There is an invitation. Indeed, there is an exhortation for sinning saints to return to God in repentance and faith. And this psalm teaches us that the covenant Lord will forgive his people and that he will restore his blessing upon them when they confess their sin to him. So we'll look at this psalm under three headings. And firstly, in verses 1 to 5, we have the God who forgives sin. The God who forgives sin. This psalm, um, it opens up with a, a wonderful word. It opens up with a declaration of blessing or happiness. Truly happy is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered, whose iniquity is not held against them, whose heart is honest before God. This is the declaration of David, the king of Israel. This is no mere theoretical or theological conjecture by David. No, this is his very experience. And then he goes on in verses 3 to 5 to tell us about that experience. In verse 3, David tells us that he had kept silent about his sin. He hid his sin, not only from men, but ultimately he attempted to hide it from God. And yet, as he, as he relates here, this time of hiding his sin was a time of intense agony within his own soul. He knew he had sinned. He knew, and he could sense the load of guilt that he was bearing. He knew that he was under God's judgment during that time. <clears throat> and this awareness of his sin, it had a devastating effect, not only on his soul, but on his very body. His bones, he says, wasted away. But it wasn't simply an accusing conscience that was gnawing at him. No, he tells us, day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. God himself was the one who was pressing David with a sense of his guilt. Under the divine sentence, David's strength was dried up like wilting grass in the summer drought. But then came that point, that point in David's experience when Nathan pointed the finger at him and said, you are the man. And David, he no longer hid his sin. He set aside the treachery and the deceit of his heart. And in verse 5, he tells us that he acknowledged his sin to God. He concealed his iniquity no longer. He confessed his transgression to the Lord. The defenses of, of, of his rebellion, they broke down and his confession poured forth like torrents of water when Adam has been breached. David laid himself bare before the Lord in all of his guilt. But then came the blessing of forgiveness. David said, you forgive the iniquity of my sin. David's transgressions were forgiven. His sin was covered. The Lord no longer counted his iniquity against him. What a marvelous transformation to go from being under the load of sin and guilt and guilt to being delivered from that and being brought again into a position of blessedness, happiness by God. But let's not miss the utterly astounding nature of what is being said here. How does this psalm begin? And I've already hinted at it. Blessed. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven. We sang the words of Psalm 1 as we began our, our service of worship. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the, of the wicked. Psalm 1 begins with the exact same word as Psalm 32. We have it translated as blessed, but it could equally, be, equally well be translated as, oh, the happinesses of. This word 
in Psalm 1 and, and in Psalm 32 is the declaration of God's blessing. And in Psalm 1, it's the declaration of God's blessing upon the perfect man, the man who is utterly perfect in every way, the man who delights in God's law. Indeed, the law of God is his chief delight. His happiness, his blessedness belongs to the perfect man. But here in Psalm 32, it's being declared to the one who has been, for, who has been forgiven of sin. And so what we see in Psalm 32 is that the Lord grants to the one who confesses his sin the blessing that belongs to the perfect man. God grants to the guilty the blessings which belong to the righteous. But how can this be? What we must notice here in Psalm 32, there are three action words. There are three action words used in the, first, in, the, in the first two verses. And these action words describe what God does with the sins of his people. And it's only as God deals with that sin that these salvation blessings are restored to sinning saints. So how, how does God deal with sin? He forgives. He covers. And he does not charge or he does not account sin to the sinner. The word translated here as forgiven is used by God when he describes himself in Exodus 34. And there God declares in verse 7 of Exodus 34 that he is the Lord. He is the covenant Lord who forgives iniquity and transgression and sin. Now that word forgive, it doesn't simply mean to let sin go. It doesn't simply mean to forget about it, to act as if it had never happened, letting bygones be bygones no it's it's a word that means to lift to carry to bear away and when God forgives sin he does something with that sin he lifts it and he bears it away and where we could ask does he take it and the prophet Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 53 and verse 12 we're told something that is utterly amazing about the suffering servant of the Lord. There Isaiah says, he bore the sin of many. And it's the same word, that word bore. The same word is translated as forgive in Psalm 32. What, is, what's, what am I getting at? Well, the suffering servant, the promised Messiah, lifted he carried, he bore away the sin of many. That transgressor in Psalm 32, David, is restored to a state of blessed, blessedness because the Lord lifted his transgressions from him and placed them upon the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. What does it mean then for God to cover sin? Well, it's interesting to note that in verse 5, David says that he would no longer cover his own sin from God. It was only when David stopped covering or concealing his sin that the Lord took over and he covered it. It has the idea of putting out of his sight. Putting sin out of his sight so that he no longer sees it. But it is only God who can successfully cover sin for the sinner to cover sin is only an exercise in, in, in futility. And then there's this phrase in verse 2. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. It could be translated, blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him. The one who is forgiven. The one whose transgression is borne away. The one whose sin is covered, that one no longer has any iniquity charged against them. As Paul says, they are justified, declared righteous. Their sin is no longer counted as their own. Does God just make it disappear? No, he doesn't. The accusation of the guilt of sin is transferred from the sinner to a sin bearer. And that was pictured in the sacrificial system of the Old Testament when the one who sinned placed his hands upon the head of the animal that was to be sacrificed. And as he placed his hands on that sacrifice and as he confessed his sins, it was a picture 
of his guilt being transferred. No longer was his own sin accounted against him. No longer did he bear the guilt of his sin because his sin was transferred to another. But we must always remember the words of the writer to the Hebrews in chapter 10, verse 4 of Hebrews, where he says, It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. And so if the guilt and the accusation of sin was only pictorially transferred to the sacrificial animal, well then where did it literally go? Well, the the Apostle Paul tells us in that passage that we read together. He tells us in in 2 Corinthians 5, two marvellous truths. He says in verse 19 that in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And then in verse 21, he says, For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. In the death of Christ, two things took place. The sin of God's elect people was discounted from the accusation against them. Their trespasses were no longer counted against them. But then another thing took place. Those same trespasses, those sins, they were charged to Jesus Christ. They were placed upon him. They were counted against him. He became the sin offering. The guilt of sinners was placed upon him. Everything, everything that David has declared that has been done by God in regards to his sin, this has all been accomplished through the suffering and the death of Jesus Christ. The blessedness, the happiness of the experience of sins forgiven, covered and not counted against him. All of this has been fulfilled through the great Messiah who was promised. It was Israel's Messiah who carried, who bore away the transgression of his people. It was the the blood of the Lamb of God which covered the sin of his people. Their iniquity was counted against him. Ultimately, the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, he suffered for the sins of others, he experienced the terrors of which David merely tasted. Jesus' bones, his entire humanity, wasted away as he suffered for sin. Day and night, God's hand was heavy against him. His strength was dried up as by the summer heat. Jesus endured the drought of being the wrath bearer, crying out in the midst of the climax of his agonies, I thirst. But let's not miss this fact. The Messiah of Israel, Jesus Christ, was the perfect man. He was the only one who ever fulfilled that picture in Psalm 1. He was the one who delighted in God's law. And to him and to him alone, the blessings of God belonged by right. And yet Jesus Christ set aside that right. And he put himself in the place of an accursed sinner. So that upon sinners might come the blessings that belonged to him, the perfect man. Because of who he is, because of what he has done as the Lamb of God. Jesus brings these blessings which are his alone. And he he grants them to those who confess their transgressions to the Lord. We could paraphrase the Apostle Paul a little and combine the language of Psalm 1 with Paul's statement. In verse 21 of 2 Corinthians 5. For our sake, God made the perfect man of Psalm 1. To be sin, who knew no sin, so that in that perfect man we might become the righteousness of God. David experienced the blessedness of the perfect man of Psalm 1 because the perfect man would come and would bear David's sin and guilt. But David, he's not content to keep all that to himself. 
He has come to this blessed experience of forgiveness of sin, but he doesn't rest and he can't rest until he, until he knows that all of God's people enjoy this restoration to God. This is no mere theoretical point that affects simply David. David realizes that all of God's people need to hear this, this news, this wonderful forgiveness, blessedness that he has experienced. And so he goes on in verses 6 to 8 to show how this forgiveness and the blessings that flow from it are offered to every believer. And so secondly, we see in verses 6 to 8, the God who restores blessing. The God who restores blessing. <clears throat> the beginning of verse 6 has a very important phrase. And it's translated as therefore. The, phrase, the, the force of this phrase is because of this. Because of all that has just been said. Because the Lord in his covenant mercy has provided a way whereby sins can be forgiven. For that reason, let all who belong to him confess their sins to him. Because of what the Lord has done through Christ in his mercy and in his grace, let every believer have confidence that the Lord will hear his or her confession of uh, prayer of confession and repentance. This is where David begins to apply the truths that he has learned. And he applies them to the people, all the people of God. This is where David declares to all believers that their sin is not a bridge of no return. Just as he has experienced forgiveness, so that forgiveness is held out to every believer who has sinned against God and who has grieved the Holy Spirit. He encourages and exhorts believers to pray in repentance and confession of sin because of what God has done in Christ Jesus. Believer, perhaps you're here this evening and you're harboring a load of guilt. And you're trying to cover your sins from the eyes of God. If that's you, then this psalm is for you. You may have crossed that bridge of sin and you may be racked with guilt, thinking that you have no welcome back with the Father again. You may think that there is no return to the blessings of fellowship with God again. But David has something to tell you. He says that there is a return open to you. This bridge is only barred by one thing, and that is your own failure to confess and repent. God is not standing at the other side of that bridge stopping you. Look what he has done to forgive you. The sacrifice, the sin offering in the person of the Lamb of God has been provided. The sin bearer, the wrath bearer has died. Why do you hold on to your sin any longer? Forgiveness is offered to you. But if this is not all marvellous enough, David shows in verses 6 and 7 that this forgiveness restores all the blessings of God's salvation to his people. Look what he says. Surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. With this forgiveness, there comes safety, security, preservation and deliverance. All of those blessings that we, uh, we, we sung about in Psalm 46. These phrases that David uses, they're, they're loaded picture words. Well, what are they pointing to? I'm convinced that David is using language that would make the informed Israelite think of the Exodus and especially the crossing through the Red Sea. Remember what the, what the Israelites were faced with as they stood at the shore of the Red Sea. Behind them, there was Pharaoh and his army. The rush of great waters was in front of them. There was nowhere to hide. They were in great trouble, in great distress, and they were surrounded with shouts of panic. But the Lord had not forgotten his people. He had redeemed them from the house of slavery. They were his, and he was going to preserve them. The Lord himself hid them from the sight of Pharaoh. 
by the pillar of cloud and fire. And he, he parted the Red Sea for them. And they went through on, on dry land. And then when they reached the other side, the great flood, it didn't rush upon them. It rushed upon Pharaoh and upon his army. And then what did the people of Israel do? They were led in a song of deliverance by Moses. You can imagine two million people singing songs of deliverance together. Each one of them surrounded by almost two million people singing a song of deliverance. These are the blessings which accompanied God's redemption of his people from the, the house of bondage. They were delivered from the one who sought their destruction. They were delivered to abide and dwell with God, to experience life with him. In safety and security. And likewise, the one who rests in Christ by faith for the forgiveness of sins shares in the restoration of all these blessings. The one who confesses their sin to God has fellowship renewed with him. They have the joy of knowing that the Lord surrounds them with victorious shouts and songs of deliverance. But it doesn't even end there. They have the joy of knowing the Lord's continual instruction of them. In verse 8, the psalmist writes, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Now, it's not exactly clear whether this is God speaking to the psalmist or whether this is the psalmist speaking to the person he is exhorting to confess their sin to God. If David is the one doing the instructing, then he instructs as the anointed king who has been forgiven. But then when we see this, this psalm fulfilled in Christ, then it is ultimately Christ who is himself instructing those whom he delivers from sin. Christ is the one who instructs us as our God and as our, and as our king. Dear believer, are you lingering in the place of rebellion against God? Do you protest against God's offered forgiveness by saying, it'll never be the same again. I've sinned and I've broken fellowship with God. Even if he does forgive me, I'll always carry that feeling that God has a bone to pick with me. I'll always be on probation with God. He'll be waiting for me to slip up and then... When I do, he'll descend on me like a ton of bricks. Dear believer, David, and the Holy Spirit through David is telling you that your fears are ungrounded. If you confess your sin, God will be faithful and just to forgive you of sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. God doesn't bear grudges. He will restore to you the joy of his salvation. God has no children on probation. You are accepted in the beloved. Confess your sin to him and be restored to his joyful fellowship again. When God forgives the sinning saint, he showers them with the blessings of salvation. But not only has David a message of encouragement to fearful believers... He addresses all those who remain stubborn against the Lord, whether they are believers or unbelievers. And so in verses 9 to 11, finally we have the God who challenges you. The God who challenges you. In verse 9, the audience changes. We don't pick it up in our English Bible, but... In the Hebrew, it's clear that whilst in verse 8, in verse 8, the, the person being spoken to is one single person. In verse 9 on, the ones being spoken to are plural, more than one person. And so it's clear that the audience is now, has now changed. The psalmist is here putting out a universal call. He's putting a challenge out to all who read this psalm. He's addressing not just each believer, but he's addressing each and every one of us who comes into contact with this psalm, whether we're believer or an unbeliever. And what does he say? He says, Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle, 
or it will not stay near you. What's he saying here? He's counseling against being obstinate. But even more than that, he's counseling against the idea of autonomy. Now, what is autonomy? In this context, autonomy is the desire to live a life free from God's rule and government. To live an autonomous life is to say to God, you're wrong about sin. And you're wrong about how I should live my life. I'll do my own thing. I live life my way. I don't need you. God, I'm getting along fine without you. That is stubborn autonomy. But David describes such a person using the picture of a horse or a mule, animals that lack understanding. And he, he, tells, us that the, he tells us that these animals are so foolish that something must be used to subdue them. And he talks about the bit and the bridle. That's the steel mouthpiece and the leather straps around the head and the nose of these animals. And these are things that are used to subdue and to direct horses and mules. But David says something very interesting about them. And he, it's, it comes out not in the ESV but in other translations. He calls these accoutrements, the, this bit and bridle, he calls them ornaments or jewellery. These things, they look so nice on a horse. If you ever go to uh, some vintage rally, you might see horses and they're, they're kitted out in all of this fine leather and fine steelwork. But what are these things? They might look like ornaments and jewellery, but what are they? They are the things that are used to control the animal. It's as if David is warning his readers. He says, do you see that thing that you take so much pride in? You treat it like some piece of jewellery on you. If you maintain your stubbornness against God, and if you persist in your pursuit of autonomy, well then God may very well use that object of your pride to subdue you and to direct you. And David sums all of this up in verse 10 by saying that there are many sorrows for the wicked. Sorrows are multiplied to those who reject God, to those who seek to forge ahead in a life of sin and autonomy against God. But what's the alternative? The alternative, as we see at the end of verse 10, is to trust in God. The one who trusts in God will go to him with their sin. The one who trusts in God will confess their sin. They will declare that God is righteous in his pronouncement of guilt against sin. The one who trusts in God will seek to live a life of glory to God, a life of grateful and loving obedience. What is God's promise to the one who trusts in him? He says, steadfast love will surround the one who trusts the Lord. That is covenant love. The Lord promises his eternal faithful love to all those who trust in him. Are you living a life of prideful sin against God? Are you persisting in rebellion towards God? Well, he's offering you here an invitation. But it's an invitation with a warning. If you trust in him, confessing your sins and repenting of them, then you will be blessed with gracious forgiveness in Christ. But if you reject God and reject his offer of mercy, then sorrows, multiplied sorrows, eternal sorrows will be your portion. And then the psalmist concludes with a call to praise God. The Lord's offer of free and full forgiveness and restoration of blessedness. This should call forth and bring forth praise and rejoicing from God's people. Dear children of God, this is the cause of our praise. This is the joy which should mark us in this life and forevermore. In Christ we share in the blessedness of the perfect man. We began by asking the question, is sin in the life of the believer a bridge of no return? David in this psalm has shown us that the answer to that question is a gracious and resounding no. The Lord has provided forgi for forgiveness for his people. 
But we must come in faith and repentance to God through the perfect man, Christ Jesus. What's the remedy for the believer who is loaded with the burden of guilt? It's the same as for everyone else. Run to Christ. Confess your sin to God. Seek the Lord while he may be found. There is no forgiveness of sin apart from him. Many are the sorrows of the wicked. But praise God we have this promise. Steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Amen. Let us stand together for prayer.